now also open the Word of God. We um, open the Word to John chapter 5. You may recall in past times I was privileged to preach in your pulpit. We um, began a series on uh, the seven miracles as you find them in the, in the Gospel of John. Of course, the Lord Jesus did a lot more miracles, but John only focuses on seven miracles because he wants to focus on the glory of the Christ and why the Lord Jesus came upon this earth. And we had looked at the first two miracles, and this morning we'll have a look at that third miracle, which is Jesus healing, um, sorry, uh, Jesus healing an invalid at the pool of Bethesda. So read John chapter 5, where we read from 1 to 29. But our text is from 1 to 19. So take particular note of verses 1 to 19, but we'll continue our reading to verse 29. We read here the word of God. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now, that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. After Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the Son and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection 
of judgment. Thus far, the reading from God's holy word. At the proclamation of the Lord's word, we will sing from Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle John had already revealed to us the glory of the Christ as the Son of God who came to take away the sins of this world and changing the water into wine on the marriage feast and in the healing of the royal official son. The glory of our Lord shines forth through these miracles as Christ the Redeemer of life through his blood and as Christ the Lord of life through his word and spirit. Now in this third miracle, the Apostle John continues to review the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God by healing a man on the Sabbath day. Thereby the Lord Jesus reviews that he came to give us rest, rest that begins in this life and continues into eternal life. For all those who believe in his name and earnestly flee from sin and flee to Christ for forgiveness and rest from their sins. In so doing, the Lord Jesus reviews himself not only as our only high priest, but also as our eternal king. He not only is the healer of all diseases and misery, but also has all authority over all life. Now this this sublime rest of our Lord Jesus is now placed over against that disturbing and unsettling rest that the Pharisees and the scribes were laying on God's people. And so, brother and sister, may proclaim to you the word of God this morning as follows. Jesus, the Son of God, reveals his glory as the one who grants rest temporarily and eternally. And so, indeed, look at these two points, temporal rest and eternal rest. So, first of all, Jesus, the Son of God, reveals his glory as the one who grants uh, grants rest temporarily and eternally. First of all, we'll look at temporal rest. Now, in our text, it was again a time, that time of the year, for another one of those Jewish feasts in Jerusalem. And so, Lord Jesus again interrupts his Galilean ministry and he goes back down to Jerusalem. Now, the city of Jerusalem had high walls surrounding it. And because it had high walls, there was also a number of gates by which people could enter into the city. The one such gate is called the Sheep Gate. Because not only people went through this gate, but also sheep to be sold for the temple sacrifices. Now near this gate, there was an extraordinary pool. So extraordinary that the people called it Bethesda. Because it was a source of mercy for those who lived in misery. Bethesda indeed means house of mercy. And then we are told that this pool was surrounded by five covered colonnades, that is, five shelters, where the sick could rest from inclement weather. Indeed, there were a great number of sick people, for we read, a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed, were gathered there, all under these shelters. Why there at that pool? That wasn't just to cool off near the pool, which might be the case. And it wasn't just to wash himself, which they may have done too. But it was because particularly that this pool had special properties. This pool had healing powers. But not continually, intermittently, from time to time. Apparently it was also necessary for a person to be the first one into the pool when the water was stirred in order to benefit from its healing powers. But who stirred the water? And how was it stirred? Well, brothers and sisters, you may have noticed that verse 4 is missing in our ESV Bibles. But you will find it in the King James Bible and the New King James Bible. 
There we read verse 3 and 4 as follows in the New King James Bible. It says, In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Whether the verse 4 is authentic or not, yeah, that is questionable. And therefore, some translations leave it out. Nevertheless, it can be said, it is the Lord's doing that this pool gave healing to people when the water was stirred, regardless of the means by which the Lord stirred the water. Thus, appropriately, the pool was called Bethesda, House of Mercy. And so around the pool, there was a great crowd of sick and handicapped people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, who yearned for mercy, who yearned for rest from this, their physical illnesses. It must have been an awful sight there around the pool. Maybe you sometimes went into a hospital, maybe to a cancer clinic, and, and you see all those people. It hits you, doesn't it? Misery, the misery that we brought upon ourselves. And so as you come to this pool, you see all kinds of misery. It reflects the brokenness of life. But man is brought upon himself because of his sin. Now, there were many men and women at Bethesda, anxiously waiting for the water to be stirred, passionately hoping to be the first one into the pool so they could be healed. That's understandable. You would do that too. I would do that too. Now, the Lord Jesus went to this pool. That would not appear unusual, for the Lord Jesus came to give relief, not so. Relief from our, our miseries, the miseries of our infirmities that caused by sin. And where else would you find such an abundance of mercy than there at the pool of Bethesda? And yet, we don't see the Lord Jesus going from one person to the next person, like the doctor goes from one person to the next person and heals one by one. No, he doesn't do that. Why not? Because these people had placed their hope in the stirring of the water. These people did not yet see the Lord Jesus as the miracle from God, from whom would come an overflowing river of living waters of life for healing of our physical and our spiritual infirmities. Further, these people at the pool thought that they could save themselves, that they could heal themselves. All it took was to be the first one into the pool. Each person thought, yes, one day. One day I'll be the fastest one. I'll be the first one in the pool and I'll be healed. So, brothers and sisters, isn't that an awful thing going on there in the pool? Sure, it was an awful sight. But worse yet is that each man and each woman was fighting for himself or herself. Me first. I want to be saved first from my misery. Everyone thought about themselves first. You could say, well, can, can you blame them? Wouldn't you and I do that too? And yet, brothers and sisters, it was sinful. There was no love for your neighbor. There was no consideration for the interests of others before yours. So here was misery at its worst. Not only physical misery, but also spiritual misery. Everyone was in it for himself, fighting for himself. If you couldn't manage to get into the pool, tough luck for you. You'd probably lay there until you die. And so you see, brothers and sisters, there must have been so much bitterness, disappointment, even anger, jealousy, and hopelessness there at that pool. That made the pool for some of them not a pool of mercy, but a pool of increased misery. For here was mercy at arm's length, so to speak, and yet still far, too far from, for each of them to reach. Here was the means of healing shown to them, and yet they could not benefit from it. Talk about hopelessness. How hopeless, depressed, brokenhearted, miserable these people must have felt. Now there's one such man laying there for 38 years. That's a long time. 38 years. The intent of telling us the length of his, 
of years is to show the depth of his misery. Year after year, he tried again and again to be the first one to the pool, but each time he failed. Each time there was always someone there before him. How frustrating. What misery. All those years, mercy at arm's length, and yet out of his reach. You can imagine his great misery. He had given up on himself. He needed someone else to help him. He sought someone else to help him outside of himself. But there was no one to help him. Each was in it for himself. Each was trying to save themselves. Indeed, there was no one on earth who looked upon this man. But brothers and sisters, there was one in heaven who did look upon him, who was watching his child. It was our Father in heaven. And the Lord Jesus testified in verse 19, Whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Now you may have wondered, why did the Lord pick out this particular man out of that whole crowd of so many ailing people lying there under the shelters and only healed him? Well, we really don't know the answer any more than God's grace, God's mercy. He says, we may be elect children when somebody down the street is not. It's God's will, God's purpose. We really don't know why the Lord particularly chose this man. But brothers and sisters, we do know a few things. We do know that the Lord is not pleased with those who seek salvation by their own efforts. That's very clear in the Lord's relationship with the Pharisees and the scribes, isn't it? And we also know that the Lord does have a heart for those who are, are broken, those who are brokenhearted, and those who are contrite of heart, who seek their salvation outside of themselves. And we can see how the Lord already prepared this man to be saved. For at this point in his life, he knew that he could no way save himself. He looked for salvation outside himself, but there was no one there to help him. And we, and we can hear the, the misery of this man's heart, can't we? For when the Lord Jesus asked him if he wanted to get well, he didn't simply give a simple answer. Yes, Lord, I want to get well. No, we hear the cry of his heart. We see the misery of his heart. Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. This man is yearning for someone to help him. This man is looking to someone outside himself, but, but there is none. You can just see this man looking up to the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, maybe you will pick me up and run with me to the pool when the water is stirred and, and finally I can be healed. Do you notice here, brothers and sisters, there is a prerequisite to receiving the mercies of the Lord. That is, that there must be a desire, a desire to be saved. For isn't it rather odd that the Lord Jesus asked the sick man, do you want to be healed? Of course he wanted to be healed. That's what he was after for 38 years. Well, maybe in the beginning, but he had given it up now. But maybe now, with the Lord Jesus in his presence? You can see after 38 years, mercy at his doorstep, yet always out of his reach, that can leave someone in a state of hopelessness, despair, giving up. Did this man truly still want to be saved from his infirmity? So this was a, a good question. Do you want to be healed? It's an important question. For it is as our confession, our Lord's Day 45 also says, God will give his grace and Holy Spirit only, only to those who ask him for these gifts. God will not give his grace to those who do not want it or who show that they do not want it or who are not interested enough by asking for it. But this man indicated that he really wanted to be healed. He poured out his heart to the Lord Jesus and looked to the Lord Jesus to relieve him of his infirmity and so grant him rest from this physical daily struggle. And brothers and sisters, those who turn to the Lord will not be left in despair. As the Lord Jesus once said, come to me. All who are burdened and heavy laden, that I will give you rest. With him there is healing from our temporal and eternal troubles. 
Now, little did this man know the power of the man who stood before him. Little did this man know that living waters flowed forth from him. To all who believe in his name, waters that healed a man, not only from physical infirmities, but also from spiritual misery. The man had been amazed that the Lord Jesus did not pick him up, but simply told him to get up, take up your bed, and walk. You can imagine, following human logic, the man may have thought, are you crazy? Asking me, an invalid, to get up and walk? Can't you see that I'm an invalid? But this man is not following his human logic, but simply does as he's told. He obeys the Lord's command, takes up his bed, and walks. It appears without hesitation, without any questioning about the healing powers of the Lord Jesus, the man immediately got up, took up his bed, and walked. And with that response, the man was delivered from his temporal, earthly misery. The man had been healed from his infirmity. The man could now enjoy rest in this life for the rest of his life on earth. The Lord had, was merciful to him, granted him healing from his physical misery. But brother says there's more to this miracle. For while this man was healed at the pool of Bethesda, he was not healed by and through the pool of Bethesda. You see, more than the pool of mercy had come to God's people. God was now visiting his people in his son and would pour out his deep love and compassion for them in the offer of his only son unto death, death of a cross. And through his death, grant them permanent healing and rest for all their troubles. But for the moment, such misery was still out of their sight, still out of the sight of God's people. It was in their reach, but they saw it not. Those who are God's chosen people will in due time come to see the Lord Jesus Christ as the only high priest and eternal king. But for the time being, it was still out of their sight. More than physical healing was necessary, a spiritual healing was necessary. A spiritual rebirth through the Spirit was necessary. But for the time being, the temporal healing will have to do. And it did give this man temporal rest from his misery. The Lord was merciful to him. But Christ came as our only high priest to give us eternal rest and peace. And so Jesus Christ was not yet finished with this man. And he will complete his work that the Father had begun in this man and has given to the Son to do, but in a different environment. And so we come to the second point, the eternal rest. <laughs> now we don't hear anything about what happened immediately after the man was healed. We're not even told that this man rejoiced and he thanked the Lord Jesus. But we do find him in the temple. And so to be expected that he rejoiced and he worshiped God. He thanked God for his healing. But we really don't know, do we? It doesn't really tell us. Apparently, that's not where the Lord wants to draw our attention. No, the focus is here now, not so much on the response of the man to his healing, but on those who saw him healed, particularly the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees. And so though we find him walking down the street with his sleeping mat under his arm, and that on the Sabbath day. And so the leaders of the Jews saw him and said to him, it is the Sabbath. It is unlawful for you to take up your bed. You could ask yourself, why does the Lord Jesus irritate the Pharisees and the scribes by healing on the Sabbath? He knows that they will be irritated by that. Because the Lord Jesus himself was very upset with the Pharisees and, and the scribes. Because they took away the rest from the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, now the Sunday, was to be a day of rejoicing in the mercies of the Lord. It was to be a day of celebrating such mercies in the communion of saints. But the scribes and Pharisees made this day of do's and don'ts, adding law upon law, which the Lord had not given to his people, which burdened the life of God's people daily, but especially also on the Sabbath day, which was supposed to be a day of rest. 
Now, this man, just healed by the Lord Jesus, did not yet know the Lord Jesus. Did not yet know that the Lord Jesus came to give much more than physical healing and rest. That is clear from his reply to the Jewish leaders. He said, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They then asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Lord Jesus had done a great thing. He had healed a man from his misery. These Jewish leaders should have rejoiced in this man's glorious healing. These Jew Jewish leaders should have recognized that God was visiting his people. They should have recognized that this man was being healed not by water being stirred in the pool of Bethesda, but by the power bestowed unto a man in the person of Jesus. But no, these Jewish leaders, they were blind in themselves. They stared so much at the law, the literal understanding of the law, that they no longer saw the foundation of love, on which the law was based, on which the law was given, on which the law needs to be fulfilled. It was a law of love and mercy, for it caused man to look outside of himself, for you and me too, to look outside of ourselves to Jesus Christ, for the fulfilling of the law. That was God's mercy, for no man can save himself. Now the man the Lord Jesus had healed was still spiritually dead. As yet, he only experienced physical healing. But these Pharisees and scribes, they were far further from the truth, and thus much further from eternal rest. We don't hear the man's answer to the question of the Jewish leaders. But verse 13, we read, Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in that place. Why had the Lord Jesus withdrawn immediately after healing this man? Again, we're not told. Perhaps the Lord Jesus didn't want to be known as a miracle worker, for after all, there were, there were many sick people, many infirmities there at Bethesda. But more to the point, it was the will of the Father that this covenant child not only be healed of a temporal infirmity, but also his spiritual, need a spiritual healing. And so, be able to enjoy not only temporal rest, but also eternal rest. And therefore, the Lord Jesus found the man, for he was not yet finished with him. That the most logical place to be on the Sabbath day, especially after being healed, enjoying God's temporal mercies, was to be in the temple of the Lord. What joy it must have given this man to be able to be in the house of the Lord again. Just think about it. For 38 years, he was lying there at Bethesda. For 38 years, he could not attend the holy services of the Lord in the temple. All those years as he laid there at the pool of Bethesda, how often must not he have been thinking of the Psalms? For example, Psalm 42 must have come to his mind. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with my God? My tears had been my food day and night. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving. And you must have also thought of Psalm 27, which you sang part of too. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I ask, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in this temple. Now healing had come to this man's body. Mercy had been shown unto him. Now was the opportunity for him to praise and worship God who had shown such great mercy and love to him. What joy must have been in his heart, overflowing. Yes, this man, as could be expected, and is to be expected, was to be found in the house of the Lord. There the Lord Jesus had the opportunity to complete his healing work in this man's life. And so also give him eternal rest from all his troubles. It comes through the words and the work of Christ. And these words are spoken in the temple. You can say in the church of the Old Testament. Brothers, it is indeed in church, in the house of the Lord, where we can receive spiritual healing. 
eternal rest from all our troubles. As Christ's word of forgiveness and reconciliation in his shed blood is proclaimed to us again and again. Healing comes by way of God's spirit working in our hearts through the preaching of the gospel for which he grants us the assurance of forgiveness of sins through his one sacrifice on the cross and so continues to grant us rest and peace through his reconciled blood and renewing spirit. Now when the Lord Jesus saw the man, he said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. We get the impression here then from these words of the Lord Jesus that this man's previous infirmities was brought on by this man's own particular sin. The Lord knew this man's illness had been a consequence of his sin or sins. And Lord Jesus now pointed out to him that God's mercy had delivered him from his sickness. But the Lord Jesus Christ also told him to overcome sin and to sin no more. He refused, but fell back into sin. Something worse could happen to him. The implication is that if he continues in sin, his sickness may return in a worse condition. But worse yet, he would be eternally lost. Indeed, brothers and sisters, how much greater does not the wrath of God burn against God's own covenant people who have experienced his mercy, enjoyed his love, and yet spurn his commandments, do not live faithfully, do not live in holiness and godliness, but continue to live in sin. Woe unto them. The man, now knowing who the Lord Jesus was, went back to the Jewish leaders and told them who healed him. Why did he do that? Some say this man didn't really repent, and he was on the side of the Jewish leaders. But that's highly unlikely, after such a merciful healing, after all those years of misery. Further, notice that this man's answer to the Jewish leaders was not on their terms, but was foremost on their minds, so that he would have said, it is Jesus who told me to take up my bed and walk on the Sabbath day. No, there was no focus here on the Sabbath day. His emphasis was entirely on the miraculous healing. He told the Jews that Jesus was the one who healed him. But these Jewish leaders, rather than seeing the compassion and mercy of the Father in heaven and the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, hardened their heart against them. These were Jewish leaders. You could say these were church leaders of God's covenant people. Yet these men hardened their hearts against the Christ. Because they refused to see things in any other way than their own way. For as long as they continued in this way, they would not enter into his eternal rest. The word of the Lord in the book of Hebrews also speaks a clear, imminent warning to God's covenant people. Today, today when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. These particular Jews in our text rejected the claim that Jesus is equal with God. That Jesus came from the Father to do the Father's work, to bring peace on earth, to reconcile a people for the Father. They should have recognized that God was working among them through the miracles his son did. They should have said, as Nicodemus said, no one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. But they were so wrapped up in their theology that they could not see him who had come from the Father to grant them eternal rest. They were so caught up in achieving their own eternal rest through the strict adherence of the law. Just as the sick at the pool of Bethesda were so caught up in achieving their own rest by tempting again and again to be the first one into the pool. These both, the sick, physical sick people at the pool of Bethesda and the spiritual sick leaders of the Jews did not yearn for our salvation outside of themselves. They thought to achieve it themselves. So at the pool, the waters were stirred from time to time. That was God's mercy to those who sought healing to their broken bodies. And the Lord Jesus also did 
miraculous healings among the Jews from time to time. That too was God's mercy to those who sought healing from their sins. But ultimately, it was to assist them to see the glory of He whom the Father had sent to be their only high priest, to be the only sacrifice and healer of all their diseases and all their sins, to see the Lord Jesus Christ. It was to assist them to submit to the only king of all creation who had also given them the Sabbath rest for us the Sunday as a foretaste of the eternal rest to come. A day of worship and fellowship with God and the saints. A day of rejoicing and praise and rest from our daily labors. Yet Christ Jesus came not to give healing from time to time as the poor Bethesda did, and as his miracles did, but he gave us continual and eternal blessings, continual healing to as many people who turn to him and return to him as often as they repent from their sins with a believing heart and seeking forgiveness and strength from the Spirit through the Word to flee from sin, to live in faithfulness and holiness and godliness. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the overflowing fountain of the Father's love, peace, and mercy unto us. In Christ's blood there is forgiveness of sins, and by His Spirit, through His Word, we are renewed week by week. May you be strengthened through the preaching of His Word today again. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise God for His amazing grace and mercy in our lives. Amen.